Okay, thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Sandrine. So yeah, I'm ESR 13. I think we're going yeah, back to front today for a change. And um, I'm in Work Package 7, system designed to reduce the levelized cost of energy. And uh, my presentation today is on the key drivers for levelized cost of energy minimization in floating offshore wind. And so yeah, big thank to um, Wavec as well, my hosting institution, especially my uh, supervisors, Jose Candido and Luis Gatto. Okay, I won't go over the project. Sandrine's just done a very good job of that, but here I am in uh, Lisbon, the Red Circle, and my two secondments were in um, Eolfi and um, Politecnico Milano, um, Eolfi in Paris. So yeah, system design was um, to reduce the levelized cost of energy. So my work looked at the development of a techno-economic model to assess floating offshore wind projects, development of a comprehensive cost database, all in all, um, to minimize levelized cost of energy. Um, so a little short introduction. Uh, first of all is um, a rationale for why marine uh, variable renewable energy is needed. As you can see below in the color, ch in the color chart, um, it's looking at average temperature increases. Um, over the last 200 years, uh, it's very scary, and I'd like to put that first just to kind of give a rationale um, behind why we need renewable energy. So around floating offshore wind specifically, it's looking at around a four times uh, drop um, reduction in uh, a cost, levelized cost of energy to become viable and compete with traditional bottom fixed offshore wind by 2030. Uh, the floating offshore wind is still in its um, sort of nascent stage, pre-commercial, there's, there's one or two commercial farms now, but scale up and standardization is really needed to reduce costs. Um, we've already tested components and systems in TRL 7 plus, um, a couple at TRL 8 and 9, so that's fully, fully deployed um, offshore and um, in demonstration de um, sort of outcomes and environments. And we're expecting very large 15 to 18 megawatt turbines with very large rotor diameters by 2030. So we're still yet to achieve full technical and cost optimization with the structures. And there's a lot of potential for reductions, as you can see um, in the bottom right plot. And it also shows that there's no real consensus on exactly how much we can reduce levelized cost of energy. It really does depend on, on, on who you ask. And in the top there, you can see that um, space is limited in the near shore areas in red up to 50 meters, which is roughly where bottom fix can operate. Um, the yellow zones and the green zones is where, as you can see, there is abundant of area um, around Europe for, for floating offshore wind. So yeah, as we scale up, larger wind turbines will require larger floating structures with a higher material cost. And so we need to look at ways of reducing that. Uh, just really quickly, this is some of the uh, technology that's out there already. Um, in red is TRL7 or lower. Um, yellow is TRL8, um, so that's demonstrating at scale. And TRL9 is, 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 is fully commercial, really. So you're looking at higher in Scotland has achieved that, and especially higher in Tampen, which is connected up to an oil and gas facility. And as you can see, the real takeaway from this is, is, the, is the explosion in capacity, really. It's still nowhere near bottom fixed, but as you can see, um, the capacity year on year and cumulative capacity is, is large, which is really um, exciting and um, interesting to see. And just actually really quickly going on to actually the types of platforms, um, this is the same, same, same range of floating offshore wind demonstrated. You can see the pivot buoy there, um, which is mooring stabilized. So it's using a tension leg platform um, for mooring stabilization. You have platforms such as the float gen, which is buoyancy stabilized. Um, you have uh, platforms like the wind, wind float Atlantic, which is kind of a mix of buoyancy stabilization and ballast. And then you have the full ballast stabilized systems at the top, mainly the high wind system, just to show you the, the three classifications that can be grouped into. So moving into levelized cost of energy, uh, it's a good idea just to have a little look at that metric before, before we go into, into the main drivers of it. So the levelized cost of energy is the um, average cost of producing one megawatt hour of energy. Um, it's essentially your lifetime cost divided by your lifetime energy generation. And the, I'm not sure if the pointer works on this one, but um, no, it doesn't yet. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's the equation there on the top. You have your life cycle costs, um, a discounted divided by your discounted generation over the time. And so what you want to do really is you want to minimize uh, the top half of that equation, your costs, your maintenance cost per year, and you want to maximize your generation. As you can see in the bottom right hand plot um, of sort of the contribution to levelized cost of energy, you can see that o and makes up between 25 and 30%, but around 60% of, of your levelized cost of energy is your, um, your CapEx components, your balance of plant, your turbine platforms, and that's what we're really trying to reduce um, and I think has some of the, the main promise. 
And as you can see from this, there's a lot of different ways of calcul calculating levelized cost of energy. You have in the top bar the traditional one that inc incorporates fuel cost as well. Then the fuel costs are removed because a lot of renewable energy you don't have to pay for for your conventional fossil fuels. Then you can go into such equations as um, a system levelized cost of energy at the bottom, or sorry, one up from the bottom. Well, that, in that includes that delta, um, which is essentially your cost of balancing, so the cost of the extra um, generators that are required. And at the bottom is uh, my levelized cost of energy, or what I'd like to sort of develop further, which is like a real levelized cost of energy um, formula, which is taking your costs and your materials actually that include um, inflation and include commodity changes as well, um, which is the alpha there, which is essentially your, the cost of your um, component. You're then translating it into real terms through inflation, uh, and then you're applying that to each component mass um, in order to get your overall cost there. The, um, the, the beta at the end there is essentially your um, like a, a weighting factor for the overall contribution of that component to overall capex. So the method behind uh, what I've been developing my PhD is um, as follows. This is not the whole model. This is just like the cost, comprehensive cost sort of database and cost model. And what essentially you're getting from here is you're looking at your platform data um, in gray on the left hand side, which is your engineering side. Um, that's grouping all of your cost data. Uh, and then what you're then doing is, is this is specifically for the platform. Um, and then you're moving into your hydrostatics once you've got your geometries um, and then you have a structural load assessment on your platform to see whether your choices of components and geometries and plate thicknesses all will be able to uh, function under a certain given hydrostatic pressure. Uh, this then moves into your cost model side on the right. Um, that's looking at your steel prices. Once you've had your chosen design and it, it passes certain tests, you then have your steel prices, you apply labor costs, the geometries, etc., cetera, um, and that then forms your final, your final platform cost, or in this case, for the platform, that can be split into your cost for, say, your pontoons, outer columns, and secondary steels. Um, so this is essentially what is going behind the cost database that I've been uh, designing. That then feeds into a techno-economic model on the cost side. Um, so costs in general, then, with floating offshore wind, they're highly sensitive to commodity changes. There's a large impact on levelized cost of energy, and uh, project viability. Costs are often static, especially in literature. You have a fixed cost per kilowatt or per unit of mass that's set at the time of publication or research. Those do not change over time. And what I'm wanting to develop in my, in my work is a range of dynamic costs that change over time with, with commodity changes. They react to market prices, they're designed for the project environment, and they adjust to scale and maintain accuracy as they're being scaled up or down. So what I'd like is one, one cost function that is then reacts to capacity, the environmental conditions and, and commodity change as well. So this is again moving on to the development of cost the cost functions in this project. Uh, so you take your raw data, you then establish the relationship between uh, the raw data at different scales. In this case, you're looking at the increase um, of the middle, middle plot there. You're looking at array power capacity, so that's the x-axis, is um, increasing power of the cable itself to achieve a cost function. So all you'd have to input is the required power in that array or export cable. That's then applied to a commodity adjustment because of the metals that are involved in those cables. And then the output of that then is uh, a function that changes over time with the right input um, arguments. The results you can see on the right hand side for this. Um, in this plot you have in yellow 2026 FID. So that is taking a prediction for future costs. We're not there yet. That is of course two years away. And in blue you have 2020. This is, this is looking at uh, prices and this is looking at inflation as well for all of these years. And the main takeaway from this is for your mass uh, mass heavy, your mass, your heavily mass components like your floater, you can see a very large difference there between um, yellow and then in blue as well. And especially the peak is in 2022. Um, you can see basically a 25% increase in your mass, in your costs, um, should you should you um, you choose to uh, purchase in those timeframes. So 25% is very significant, I think, for uh, for these costs. I then worked on to a little bit of prediction methods. It's very hard to predict the future, <laughs> but um, I did my best to try and do that. And so what I was trying to do is establish uh, forecasting and time series forecasting using machine learning methods. Uh, there's three that you can see on screen now on the left is using a autoregressive moving average. 
Um, and then in the middle is a different type of um, autoregressive moving average, um, which takes more, and then on the right, it takes seasonality um, into the picture as well. And as you can see from the um, RMSE values, the best was in the middle, and this really does change time to time. But what I'm trying to do is train a large amount of cost data and pricing data and get better predictions um, out of the other end um, that can then be applied. Because at the moment, we have, we have really good data, but when you get to the predictions from 2020, uh, well, 2025 to 2030, as you can see on the right-hand side of the bottom three plots, um, it's getting very hard to predict those. But, um, but as you can see, the main takeaway from those three graphs is the really wide, the, um, very large variation in levelized cost of energy values. Um, as you can see, you're looking at about 80 euros per megawatt hour, um, up to about 180, depending on the type of model used. But I'm, I'm looking forward to developing these further to try and get some more accurate predictions on, on future costs to, to, to better analyze um, the, the cost of the components. So the next key driver I'm going to talk about is project financing. Um, this is, again, a massive key driver of, of, of levelized cost of energy. Uh, it involves the, the equity and the debt of your um, capital that you're looking to, to get for investment in projects. And this needs to come down drastically in order for floating offshore wind to be viable. In this plot, you have um, a discount rate of 4%. And this is, as you can see, heavily, that R is heavily involved on both sides of the levelized cost of energy equation. And this essentially covers the, the cost of your, of your capital for your project. At a discount rate of 4%, you can see this project is, 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 really, is really viable, this floating offshore wind. To have this in perspective, this was a techno-economic model that I designed that has a one gigawatt farm capacity, just off, I'm a bit biased, just off the coast of uh, Portugal. And as you can see from this project, um, in, your, your net balance is in blue there, so you have a massive drop in your net balance from zero, that's your expenditure, and then you're looking at the recovery throughout the project lifetime on the x-axis from, from minus five years, because Year one is generation. There's a lot that goes in before the generation. And year 25 is the project end date. And as you can see, the project has a, is, is quite successful um, with a, uh, a net present value of around, I think, $2 billion at that stage with a um, discount rate of 4%. And as you can see, over time, generation is discounted, as is, um, as is the method in the levelized cost of energy equation. Moving on to R equals 6%, and this drops considerably. Your profit of the system is halved. Um, as, as you're getting more and more discounted generation, which is, no, which is then not working off your debt balance through revenues as quickly. That's kind of like R equals a 6% is pretty much where bottom fixed offshore wind is, and that's where we really w want floating offshore wind to get to. Um, and then as you move on to R equals 8%, as you can see this project now is, 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 is again lowering in, in um, profitability. You're looking at about 300 million net present value. That's dropped quite a lot since the last one of around a billion. And as you can see, at 8%, that's still a very good discount rate for floating offshore wind at the moment through project risks and, and obviously the cost of, cost of borrowing and capital. So um, as you can see, it's really highly sensitive to, to your borrowing and your borrowing costs and your lender's um, costs. So this is something we need to really try and de-risk. That's through demonstration, that's through more, more installed um, capacity floating offshore wind um, offshore. So moving on to the next key driver of levelized cost of energy, which I see as the platform. On the left, you have the steel thickness, and on the right, you have the cost in euros per tonne. This is all taken from, um, forgive the lack of reference, uh, one of the flower um, um, supervisors, Aaron Baczynski's work, I believe, on looking at um, different costs, different, um, different types of reference platforms. As you can see, the main takeaway from this is that there's really high variation in steel thickness, for example, through those different designs, um, especially as you increase through um, the scale and sizes of the platform from two megawatts up to 10 megawatts. And the cost in of, of uh, per tonne is, again, massively different. You're looking at a difference of 800 euros per tonne up to about 6,000 in one paper. So again, this is huge variation. And so when you're looking at an accurate cost of energy analysis, and if you're looking at your costs from literature, then which one do you choose from? There's such a massively high variation between different thicknesses, geometries, um, and cost in the system. So um, that's what I'm trying to work on is kind of like a more standardized set of costs. Um, so moving on, um, I think I'm nearly taking up all my time. This is again looking at um, just the, the, the main takeaway from this again for displacement and mass of the platform. And on the right hand side, um, platform draft and diameter, 
big, big variations and especially large variations within the say, size and capacity of platforms at, say, five megawatts. There's some um, large platform differences. This next plot is on the left-hand side looking at the, um, the diameter and doing a structural load analysis for the, for the platform. On the left, you're seeing that um, a yield strength um, of around a half, you need about 50 millimeter plate thicknesses um, to achieve that, and that's with a, a safety factor of 50%. On the right-hand side, you're looking at platform increase in costs um, in millions of euros. The bottom one is a 40 millimeter um, pontoon. The in 80 millimeter pontoon is the middle, and 120 millimeter at the top. And this is the diameter of the column itself on the on the uh, on the bottom x-axis there. And as you can see, the platform increases from say 15, um, 15 million total cost up to about 25 through increases in plate thicknesses. So this is really important that we get this right. That increase would push your levelized cost of energy for this project from 81 to 115 euros per megawatt hour, a 41% increase. I will go through these very quickly. Um, I'll only be a couple more minutes, but hybrid systems is another way I think that we can drive down levelized cost of energy. You can get more power production on one platform. You can see on the top there, you have these kind of drops in wind resource, um, which is in blue. But you then, as the wind speed drops, you have the wave and period, which still remains high through these, these periods, which can broaden out your energy profile. Um, this, is, this can be in a combination of different methods. For example, a co-located array of wave energy converters, or what is more interesting is potentially a protective shield of wave energy converters that can lower your, um, your significant wave height within your, within your project, leading to a, a potentially quicker installation and operations and maintenance um, procedures. So, um, moving on then finally to um, my uh, project, which is basically a case study located in Portugal, as you can see Lisbon in the middle there, but just to the right of that red square. It's called the Aerosera Wind Farm, about gigawatt of capacity. The turbines are 15 to 18 megawatts, around 30 kilometers from shore. Now, what I did is essentially looked at what would be the impact on your operation and maintenance and also your levelized cost of energy. Um, this is on the left-hand side, is with no protection of wave energy converters whatsoever. You're looking at about 73 euros per kilowatt per year OPEX, levelized cost of energy about 86 megawatt hours. Now, if you were to then locate your array in this kind of middle part here with some protection from a protective outer level, your levelized cost of energy is then 82, so that's a 5% drop, and your OPEX costs go down by about 30%. And finally on the right, this is looking at about 1.1 meter HS. This is in this kind of blue zone right here where you're getting the most benefit from the significant wave height drop. That's looking at about 35% drop in OPEX, or another 7% uh, drop in levelized cost of energy. So there is real potential there for, I think, co-located arrays that are um, that doesn't take even that many wave energy converters, but you can see the difference there in terms of, um, in terms of costs and um, operations and maintenance. So um, just to conclude then, so costs must decrease for floating offshore wind to be viable, and commodity markets do have a large impact on, on CapEx. There's large variation in reference platform geometries and, and they often follow a conservative design, especially in plate thickness that can be reduced. There's lots of potential areas for levelized cost of energy reduction, including scale up, de-risking in platforms, hybrid systems, and more there. And future work looks at further optimization of, a of the cost model, um, machine learning potentially for the time series, like I mentioned, getting those, those, those predictions better in the future and validating those with more data. Um, automation of the model and validation with real, real project levelized cost of energy. Um, and further development of my uh, real levelized cost of energy metric as well. Um, that's all I think I've gone over, so thank you very much for your time and I welcome any questions. So thank you, Craig, for your nice presentation. Uh, so we have, um, so first an announcement. So the presentations will be uh, put on the website in a few days, I would say, for the one who want to see them later on and to have access to the slides. Uh, so are there any questions in the room for Craig? Okay. Yeah, um, Craig, you are using uh, autoregressive methods for time series forecasting for the for the costs of uh, materials. I mean that assumes that uh, past time series values are descriptive for the for the future. I'm I'm not sure if this is uh, always the case. Are you trying to integrate also like maybe uh, 
expert uh, analysis, like forecasts from, I don't know, World Economic Forum experts making predictions on, on prices? Yeah, so basically, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's as you can see from those root mean, root mean squared error, um, there was a lot of variation um, up to about, I think, 400 or 500. This is a huge range. So yeah, it's not the only method, and also it's the massive peak in, in, in costs that we've had over the last couple of years that are hopefully once in either lifetime or one every 30, 40 years of, of, of uh, frequency. So to use those and put those into the model, I think, would be um, worrying. So it's a case of having a look and seeing when I remove the peaks we've had recently, what are the results, um, and also then including them as well to see how they are. But it's quite early work with that. I'm looking at kind of developing that model future. Um, further. Yes, and to answer the other part of your question, I think, um, yes, validation with other methods is really good. Um, I think the, like the World Bank do some good work with commodity markets. Um, they used to do really nice predictions till 2035, but they've stopped them now, so that's a, so less validation, really, than I, I'm hoping they come out more. But yeah, looking at taking um, information from experts, of course, wherever, wherever possible. But yeah, there's lots of different methods of um, time series prediction, so it's um, nice to keep, to keep looking at it and to keep validating when I have time. Thank you. Maybe uh, one last question. I think you had one. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question about your, uh, the, the last slide you showed. And it's not about the slide, but you mm. showed this uh, wind farm uh, uh, at, in Portugal. And I want to ask you uh, what, what interest rate you took there. You showed uh, a lot of difference in interest rate, 8%. But did you take 8% to calculate the answer? It was 8%, yeah. 8%, yeah, 8 okay. Yeah, 8 yeah. And uh, then you get about 80 euros. Between per 80 and 90 uh, euros. Yeah, before. yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then I'm, you started your presentation with you, you need to reduce it four times. And then I think you'll reduce it already. Yeah. <laughs> if you... Uh, because for a, for a monopile, it's about 50 or 60. Um, and, uh, yeah, depending on where you are. Yeah, potentially in the, yeah, around um, in calmer areas. Yes, I think about so, 40 uh, to 50 years in the megawatt area. Yeah, okay. So this is, yeah, the model where it's currently at. And this, this was actually, there was like, there was three different methods. There's like a high forecast, a medium forecast, and a low forecast when it comes to um, working out your learning rates and like from from doublings of capacities, so that was set on the highest, because from there's a lot of different projections of where we're going in terms of expected cumulative global capacity to, to base your learning rates on, but um, from all the data that I could found for projections for 2030, the 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 high the high scenario, the most capacity seemed to be the one that was working out. So um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, Lai Nieto from Rockwind. I was uh, wondering, uh, these estimations of um, LCOE, which kind of level of error could have uh, from design? So you estimate uh, the, um, the material cost, the IP, and the discount rate, and, and the commodity prices, but um, you can end up uh, with uh, an error of uh, around... Error margins, it's hard for me to really answer that. I think um, just because the, each component is so sensitive to changes, really, um, in terms of your the, the plate thickness as well and the mass is one of the largest drivers of that. And it's whether you're assuming that's throughout the whole platform, um, the overall cost of those. And obviously, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainties in those, in those measures. But that's what I'm trying to do is establish a range of sensitivities which show that you know, it's, I'm trying to encompass like all, all the results essentially. So having a range of plate thicknesses where I know that um, the actual will be within those bounds really. But um, yeah, there's, with, with all levelized cost of energy predictions, there's, 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 there's uncertainties of course, yes. Okay, thank you. So I think we can thank you again, Craig.